Okay, chapter 10, Islamic art, Islam art. <clears throat> okay. So, real quick, the main prophet uh, for Islam is Muhammad. And um, through his teachings and the explanation in the Quran, which is the um, religious text for, uh, for Islam, he was uh, he had the opportunity to meet uh, Allah, which is the name uh, for God in Islam, and from there uh, was able to come back to the earthly realm and disseminate information coming from Allah. And um, this is the main tenets and um, uh, profounding uh, religious elements to Islam. And we'll see that the Islamic art is going to reflect a lot of these different um, uh, commandments that are going to be given in regards to um, the inner change um, between Muhammad and Allah, okay? And what some of those tenets and some of those elements will be is that we're not going to see a, a level of figurativeness in the artwork. It's going to be more symbolic and more um, algebraic or mathematical through symbols and designs and patterns and not um, the use of figure. And um, which makes sense because a lot of our present day mathematics comes from the algebraic uh, mathematicians from, um, from the Arabian or not Arabian but the Islamic world. Um, and I believe it is actually um, from the Arabian Peninsula that algebra has come to be. Um, so even the mathematical elements that we see today um, originated with some of these very uh, pattern-driven, formula-driven concepts um, in the finer arts elements of Islam. Um, so we won't see figures, all right? We won't see images of Muhammad. We won't see images of Allah. We won't see images of um, of, of, of really um, prophetic individuals in Islam, okay? Um, Islam did rise during the Byzantine Empire. So what we just discussed with Byzantine art, um, the Islamic world was on the rise at that time. It was coming to be. And if you look at map 10.1, you can see what the Islamic world looked like around 1500 and how expansive it was, where Islam was the, was the major religion of that time. And you can even see all the way to Spain is as far west as it reached. And you can see that it was formerly Muslim territory, but then uh, that changed uh, around 1500. Uh, so because of that a lot of the mediterranean areas to the east and then northern africa and then all the way even to india and butting up against uh, areas of southern uh, china and over into vietnam and laos area was uh, influenced by um, by islam okay so it was very expansive but you will see in map 10.1 that area of uh, constantinople which becomes istanbul was um, during this time um, um, controlled and, and organized and governed by, by Islam. Okay? Um, there's going to be a heavily influence of architecture, obviously, with the religious centers of Islam, and that would be called a mosque. Okay, a mosque. So with Judaism, we're looking at a synagogue. With Christianity, we're looking at a church or a cathedral. And then with... Um, Islam, we're looking at a mosque. And we're going to talk about the mosque. So architecture is going to be very important, just like it was and it has been with the advent of Christianity under Constantine and after Constantine with the uh, Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire in particular in Byzantinum, is that it's going to be very much about the basilica. It's going to be very much about the uh, central plan of San Vitale as well as Hagia Sophia. And it's going to be very much about the architectural structure and less about idols and images. So like with Byzantinum, it was about let's consider the iconophiles and the iconoclasts. Some wanted images of Christ's child 
and Virgin Mary and different prophets and apostles. And then those were the iconophiles, but then some the iconoclasts didn't want that imagery and that figurative imagery. So that's actually something that the iconoclasts and the is in Islam have in common is that they don't want to have these misrepresentations of a divine individual. And that's where it comes from with Islam is that who are we as material beings um, to be able to decipher and, and, and create a visual um, staple of what divinity looks like, what these divine representatives or God Allah himself looks like, you know. So that's a big part of not having that figurative element in Islamic art. And the same was with the, the Byzantine. Um, so we're going to have heavy use of architecture, and we're also going to see tiles and mosaics being used. So ceramics is going to become very popular, and what are called luxury arts. Okay, so some of the luxury arts can be uh, casted metals as well as um, gilded uh, metalwork and metal smithing jewelry and also carpets and ceramic ware and all these things are going to become luxury luxury arts so luxury is going to be a big component of uh, islamic art as in in islamic art is going to be broken up into two two periods there's going to be the early islamic art period as well as the later islamic art period okay so let's begin with um the beginning with the early and we're going to look at figure 10.2, and it's the Dome of the Rock, okay, in Jerusalem. Um, and the first question that comes in with figure 10.2 is where do we start to see the use of tile work and mosaics? And we've talked about mosaics with um, the uh, terrace of, um, of the Byzantinum work, like with Justinian and and uh, Bishop Maximinius and his attendants and the clergy and the soldiers that we saw in Theodora and her attendants. And that's where we saw a lot of more recent mosaic work. And then that branches all the way back to the departing of Abraham and Lot that we saw in late antiquity. So the use of mosaic. And that's a composition of small little uh, glazed or colored uh, pieces of ceramic or glass or marble. Uh, marble would be the opaque. The glossy glazed stuff would be ceramics, and then the ear translucent or the aluminous uh, material would be the glass, right? So here we can see that there, with figure 10 too, Dome of the Rock on the exterior, that there is an emphasis on this tile work and these mosaics, but the mosaic work is not creating figurative, it's creating design and pattern. So know that the mosaic work is going to show you design and pattern, and it's also going to show you Arabic. Okay, so there will be images of use of the, the tile working to show um, um, Arabic, and that Arabic is going to be a transcription from often information found in the Quran. Okay, so very religious points that are being made in Arabic upon some of the surfaces of these buildings and these are in this architectural structure, these mosques. Um, to to always show in the importance of the reading of the word of Allah or God. Um, so that's why we're going to see the patterns and the symbols in the writing and not figurative. Okay, they're going to be they're very it's a very intellectual movement with Islamic art and it's about learning to be literate and learning how to read the word of God and to know the word of God or Allah in 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 their belief. Okay, so you're going to see that on the buildings and the architectures, writing, not imagery, but writing. <clears throat> um, figure 10.3 is the interior of the Dome of the Rock, and um, the question may come up, well, you know, what is this rock? But before we get to that, look at the gilded brilliance of pattern and design and ornamentation of pattern and design on the inner dome of the Dome of the Rock. Okay, you can see that there's little black areas in towards the top of the dome, which is interlacing Arabic that's within the pattern work of the overall um, design of the interior of the dome. Okay, so there's a very much about again that ornateness, and we saw that with the interiors of San Vitale 
and Hagia Sophia where the exterior was very austere and the inside was just this brilliant use of ornamentation and color and brilliance and vibrancy. The same thing is happening here with Islamic art. Okay? But if you look at figure 10 too, that there is ornament, more ornamentation on the exterior as well, found in the form of gilded brass, copper, or gold on the outside, and then also colored uh, ceramic tile. On the outside so they do give some coloration and emphasis of importance on the exterior to kind of you know bring people in visually and then once you get on the inside it just becomes even more ornate okay and the question with the what is the rock um, some say you know it's Abraham's sacrifice of, of his son like the lamb of God um, or this could be Adam's grave from Adam and Eve Right? So the same, same, some of these same stories originate from, a, from an original source, and the original source is actually Abraham himself. Um, so the biblical um, um, uh, parables that you hear about Abraham and his son uh, Isaac is very reflective in, in Islam as well. Um, I am not well versed in the Quran at all, so I'm going to stop there and make sure that I don't misinterpret anything in particular about um, Islamic belief. But um, there are similarities, not just in Islam and Christianity, but also in Judaism, that branch from the story of Abraham. So again, what I'm saying with the rock itself is it's not quite certain Everyone has a different belief on what this rock uh, some, uh, means and symbolizes. And some believe that it is the area where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, and then he was stopped by God or Allah, and or this is where Adam's grave is. And also um, that it is a possibility that um, this is where Muhammad ascended to heaven, okay, where he ascended to the heavens. Uh, so it could be one of uh, those are the three meaning, uh, leading possibilities um, with the importance of the Dome of the Rock. So but it boils down to the LCD, the least common denominator. That is a very sacred location. It's a very sacred place. OK, um, do know that the archway system that you see that's going around full circle, we should be able to remember what that archway system is called when you have a series of um, barrel arches or those sprung arches side by side that's called an arcade okay the arches themselves in this case actually are catenary arches and then the pillars or the columns become the continuation of those arches which makes it look like a sprung arch but it's actually a catenary arch it's a series of catenary arches on top of the capitals of the pillars or of the columns that creates an arcade of arches all the way around Okay, and we're going to see and we're going to find that this pattern, this three dimensional pattern, is going to be repeated um, throughout the architecture. Like if you look up a couple more tiers, you see the window units in the lower part of the dome before it becomes uh, before it actually becomes the hemispherical dome that repeat that same pattern concept that you see down in the arcades. All right. <clears throat> Um, let's see. So again, I talked about the um, Arabic and how we see that the Arabic is present here in the Dome of the Rock. And be able to, you know, this is nothing new. We did see the hieroglyphics in regards to Egypt. So this is something that um, is more um, sacred to the Quran, having the Arabic, versus, you know, the hieroglyphics were um, very much speaking to the importance of the pharaohs and the family of the pharaoh and so on and so forth. Okay, but this is um, this is something that we've seen before, but here it's more on a basis of religiosity and less of individuals like we saw in Egypt. Okay, um, and again, geometric over figures. So we're not going to see figures. We're going to see more geometric patterns and structures. And you can see 10-4, figure 10-4 is another view of the Dome of the Rock on the inside. You can see how this is a sequential, like a fragmental or sacred geometry sequence of patterns that are working its way from the bottom from the arch or the arcade of the arches all the way up to the dome structure where it almost looks like an optical illusion of not knowing if it's concave or convex and that's what good patterning will do all right 
So now let's talk about the floor plan of a mosque. And what we'll do is we'll refer to uh, figure 10-5, and that's the Great Mosque in Syria. And we'll break down the, the system of what the Great Mosque looks like with 10.6a. Uh, so look at figure 10, oh, I'm sorry, 10.6a. Um, sorry, my bad, figure 10 Eight, um, and this is the the plan of the Great Mosque. Okay, and the Great Mosque is in. Uh, th I'm sorry, this Great Mosque. There are multiple Great Mosques, but this Great Mosque is going to be in. Um, oh, I'm, I apologize, folks. Take the last 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and remove them. I want you to look at Figure 107, the aerial view of the Great Mosque in um, uh, Tunisia. And we're going to look at the diagram of that in figure 10.8, okay? So in figure 10.8, a great mosque is broken up into eight different parts. The number eight is going to be very significant for Islam, okay? I can't go into the symbolic reasoning of that. I'm not well versed in religiosity whenever it comes to Islam, but I do know that the number eight is going to be very significant. So the Great Mosque is broken up into eight main features. And we'll also see the eight-point star um, throughout Islamic patterns and, um, and symbolic preparations within, within the mosque themselves um, and the patterns and the symbolism. All right, so it's going to be broken down into these eight features. You have the uh, Qibla wall, which is number one, and that's the main wall of entrance. And when entering the mosque, it is meant to be this feeling of entering into a divine area, almost as if the mosque has transgressed the material world into the heavenly or spiritual world whenever you enter it. And that great wall in which you pass through the Qibla wall is going to be the entryway um, is going to be the, 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 the interface between the material and the spiritual. Then number two is the uh, mihrab, which is the actual entrance where you enter into the mihrab, and that's when you're like walking into this cleansed environment. Um, then you have number three, which is the mihrab dome, which is that small little dome feature right above the entryway into the mosque. And then... Um, you have number four, which is the hypostyle prayer hall. And the hypostyle prayer wall is, um, the hypostyle is a new, um, is a new uh, type of style of columns. And it's something that we haven't seen before. And what it is, is it's actually a series of columns. If you look at figure 1011 as an example, of a hypostyle and it's a series of these columns that are repeated just like we would see in like Greek or Roman um, temple structures but in this case in the mosque the reason we call it a hypostyle with all these columns collectively congregating together is because it's shrouded that means it's covered it has um, it, it's um, what how do I have it in my notes um, roofed it's roofed Okay, it's completely covered. It's it's hidden. The only way that you can see these columns is by entering into the mosque and being with them in person by entering into the mosque. So we have that prayer hall that has that hypo style uh, colonnade, series of colonnades that you can't see from the exterior. You can only see them by being within the walls of the mosque okay and that's why we call it a hypo style because it's within it's not exposed to the exterior it's only seen within then you can see number five from figure uh, 10 8 um, is that nave so they have a nave as well all right and that nave is um, going to again be that kind of umbilical uh, direction into the entrance dome which opens up into the forecourt, which is the place of worshiping. That's the place in which they bow down and they bow to the east towards Mecca. All right. So it's all this kind of transitional segueing into this spiritual realm or spiritual location known as the mosque from the material world that is outside. 
okay? And then number seven, like I said, is the forecourt where everyone uh, places their carpets down onto the ground and then bow to the east and pray towards Mecca. Um, I don't know how many times they pray a day. I want to say eight, but I don't want to misquote. Um, but they pray multiple times a day. And if anybody knows and wants to send an, uh, an email to me and inform me, uh, please let me know. That would be great. Um, and then number eight itself is the minaret. And the minaret is the place in which someone ascends the minaret to announce that it's time to pray, to announce that the day has begun, to announce that Allah is waiting for your prayers, okay? So that if you're in business or anywhere in the town, you can hear the calling in song in Arabic from the minaret of, of, a, of, of, a, of a Muslim man, most likely, um, calling out to anyone in the town to, to know that it is now the hour to pray. And so whatever you're doing, you're supposed to stop, lay out your carpet, focus towards Mecca, and then bow and pray if you're in business. So it's very in inclusive. Um, you don't have to just be in the mosque. Try to come to the mosque if you can. If not, um, you can do it in your place of work. All right, what else do I have here? Um, the hypostyle prayer hall will change over time, but the main features will remain kind of that enclosed series of colonnades um, that will remain that hypostyle colonnade. So looking at figure 10, 8, you can see all the little black dots, and those are all uh, hypostyle columns. Okay, so this is a new style that we're learning about. Um, yeah, so that pretty much is the floor plan of the Great Mosque, again, coming from figure 10-7 uh, from uh, Tunisia, all right? So be able to know that, be able to break down, um, and then also refer to figure 10-11 to show you what it looks like inside of the hypostyle prayer hall and what that series of colonnades looks like, all right? Um, I do, before we get into the luxury arts of early Islamic art, I want to show you um, the dome in the front of the mihrab of the great mosque in Spain, in Mezequita, figure 1014. And you can see the, the eight-sided um, eight star, which is very prominent in Islam. So that pattern of that eight-sided star, which is actually the vaulting, um, this is actually a growing vaulting system of inner, inner lapping, or interlacing pointed arches that create this eight-pointed star. Okay, and you can see the beauty of that pattern in that it is actually a concave eight-pointed star on the inside part of the dome. All right, so concave would be going in, right? So if you're looking at it upside down, which figure 1014 shows, it's concave, and that eight-point star is being created by a series of pointed groined arches. Pointed groined arches, which are going to actually come in to play in cathedrals later down the road during the Middle Ages, okay? So on the exterior will be the convex dome, and then on the interior of the dome is the con, is the uh, concave eight-pointed star. Okay, so that's figure 1014. All right, luxury arts. So our luxury arts are going to be, um, we're going to look at some ceramics, and we're going to look at the dish with the Arabic proverb. And that figure is going to be figure 1021, 1021. And um, this is where we're actually going to see a little bit of controlled abstraction. And what they're doing is they're elongating some of the Arabic, which is going to be the black section all the way around the rim of the plate. And they're elongating parts of Arabic so it makes you focus on the center part of the dish. Okay, so it is an abstraction, but it's a controlled abstraction using the Arabic language. Um, to to give this uh, to give this proverb this Arabic proverb um, and that Arabic proverb by the way in figure 1021 is knowledge is bitter tasting at first but in the end it is sweeter than honey good health so these kinds of plates and these plates in particular 
were called, these dishes in particular were called a samaragard. That's S-A-M-A-R-G-U-A-R-D, samaragard. Uh, ware, W-A-R-E. And ware is just another name for ceramics that's been fired in a kiln. Um, and these were, um, they were often distributed to um, uh, different households. So it was meant to be used, but it was also decorative in nature, making it luxury art, where these proverbs were very important to be able to read and see on a daily basis whenever um, you were within the kitchen and preparing food. And they were meant to promote good health within the family dynamic. So the luxury ware was there as a possible using, uh, you can use it meaning utility, you can place food upon it, but uh, more often than not it was used as a decorative piece to uh, signify the importance of good health and good uh, continuation of health for the family in which you're uh, gifting this plate or this dish to, all right? So that's an example of luxury art in early Islamic art. Real quick, this is a dark pink clay, and then it's bathed in white slip, and that's where you get the white. And then they use an oxide um, to paint or brush the black Arabic all the way around. And you can see that the, um, the level of um, concentration that's required to make sure that the Arabic is perfectly written, even in this abstraction. So again, literary arts for the uh, Islamic world and Islamic fine arts is extremely important because it's all about the Quran. Everything that you do is about uh, the Quran and anything that you do is supposed to be a representation of Allah, okay? Even in the luxury art that you use for display in your home. And now we're gonna look at the, let me see what time we have. I might break up this video a little bit. Yes, I'm gonna break up the video. All right, folks, so um, I'm going to stop it there, and then I'm going to talk about later Islamic art in the next video. All right, see you soon.